Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you, Dr. Crawford, for the invitation. It's really great to be able to contribute to this really wonderful educational conference. So this is a, a, a topic I'm really excited about. There's been a lot of evolution in this space in terms of management of oligometastatic prostate cancer. Uh, I've no disclosures. Other than I'm a radiation oncologist, and most of what I'm going to talk about is utilizing radiation in this space. We'll cover some other stuff, too. Uh, so the first question I'm hoping to answer uh, in the next 20 minutes, which of the following is the best current definition of oligometastatic prostate cancer? Great. Question two, which of the following is true regarding stereotactic ablative body radiation, also called SBRT, metastasis-directed therapy for M1 prostate cancer? Retrospective studies suggest local control of the target lesion is above 90%. Retrospective studies suggest grade 2 plus toxicity is less than 10%. Saber significantly improves prostate cancer specific survival compared to best systemic therapy alone. All of the above or A and B only. Go ahead. And the third and final question. Prospective randomized trials have demonstrated superior overall survival following radical therapy to the prostate in M1 prostate cancer. True or false? Interesting. Okay, so this is, this is the case we'll focus on. Um, it's a 59-year-old man, otherwise healthy. He presented with lower urinary tract symptoms, PSA 23. Um, on DRE, he had a T3 examination, and he had trust-guided biopsy that showed Gleason grade 4 plus 5, prostate adenocarcinoma, 12 out of 12 cores. Here's his MRI. This is a coronal projection. Uh, as you can tell, he's got clear extracapsular extension. He's got some enlarged pelvic lymph nodes, all of which were below the aortic bifurcation. He had a whole body uh, technetium 99 bone scan that showed radio tracer uptake in the right seventh rib. This was sclerotic on CT. We did a CT guided biopsy of that lesion. Okay, thanks. Um, we did a CT guided biopsy of that lesion, and it turned out that it was positive for prostate adenocarcinoma. And so, um, even just a few years ago, uh, in this situation, we used to throw our hands in the air and say, this is metastatic cancer, it's incurable, we're going to give you some medicine, it'll keep the cancer at bay for a while, eventually the medicine won't work, we'll switch to a different medicine, and eventually you're going to die of prostate cancer. Um, and I think that dynamic has radically changed, and thus the concept of management of oligometastatic disease um, in order for a curative approach to be successful, there really is a three-tiered um, approach that's necessary in those who have M1 disease. The cornerstone of that is effective systemic chemohormonal therapy, um, which we're not going to talk a whole lot about during uh, my presentation because we're going to talk a lot about that the rest of the morning. Uh, but that clearly is the cornerstone of treatment where we're affecting the cancer cells we can't see on advanced imaging. Um, uh, number two is some form of metastasis-directive ablative therapy. Uh, either cryoablation, HIFU, I think the most mature of which is uh, stereotactic body radiation therapy or SABR. And then three is some sort of extirpation or sterilizing local therapy to the primary site. Um, so oligometastatic disease, we touched on this a little bit, but the traditional definitions are based upon the number of lesions on technetium-99 bone scan, and occasionally we reference anatomic site of involvement. Uh, there does appear to be a good amount of biological variability, and there are some molecular studies that have looked at the different gen genomics of the metastasis versus the primary tumor. And so just because we see images that suggest oligometastatic disease, the biological behavior can actually be quite different. And more recently, novel imaging tools um, have come to fruition, including whole body MRI, novel PET radio tracers, that have really changed the way we think about oligometastatic disease. An example of that uh, was in the uh, Journal of Nuclear Medicine just last year um, by the Cornell Group, where uh, they um, scanned a patient with technetium-99 bone scan that we're all used to. That's the image on your left. And then uh, used a uh, ligand a PSMA-based radio tracer image. And uh, in the same patient, we have two dramatically different images where we're finding osseous metastasis visceral metastasis, uh, and so I think this is a moving target. Um, there are a few studies out there that help us define the oligometastatic state. Um, the, the first 
Uh, several of these are studies that have been published that primarily looked at lesions that were th you know, less than three to five in number and primarily bone only. Um, and they either use sodium fluoride PET or technetium bone scan. And then I added a few ongoing um, clinical trials through tertiary cancer centers. And you can see this, these, uh, the, the imaging modalities aren't necessarily specified and the number of lesions and where those lesions are located are quite variable. So I think the answer to this question is that is D, I think this definition is evolving and I don't quite know what oligomystatic prostate cancer is right now. Okay, let's move on to actual uh, how to treat these patients in our, our sample patient. We'll start with metastasis-directed therapy. So the rationale for doing something like this, of delivering aggressive therapy uh, to metastatic disease, is one, early ablation of metastatic disease may reduce the risk of skeletal events or other complications from disease progression. Uh, metastatic lesions, uh, again, may have different molecular phenotype, and that may translate to systemic therapy resistance. And by targeting these lesions, we may delay or defer castrate resistance, and perhaps we delay the initiation of cytotoxic chemotherapy or other therapeutic augmentation. And of course, the goal of this, the end game, is to improve oncologic outcome under the very simplistic principle that less cancer in the body is a good thing, because few of us have seen patients uh, die of prostate cancer with a low disease burden. And so in terms of studies uh, on uh, SBRT, which is probably the most mature of which, there's other modalities we can use to ablate metastatic lesions. Um, there's several on using SBRT, which is essentially radiosurgery for metastatic lesions. There's five that are published. Uh, these are all case series. So they're all retrospective designs. The numbers are still relatively small. Um, they're predominantly bone lesions that were targeted, but include some visceral lesions and several that involved lymph nodes as well. And what I want you to take from this slide is that the evidence to date would suggest that this is a safe thing to do, where we really haven't seen any grade three or higher toxicity, um, and the, the risk of grade two or higher toxicity is quite low. And in the studies that did report local control specific to the targeted lesion, we see excellent ability to sterilize whatever we're targeting with this type of intervention. And so overall, this is a very well-tolerated treatment that seems to control the lesion quite well. We don't have great evidence as to how this affects harder oncologic outcomes. We do know that in two of these studies um, where they did look at uh, freedom from androgen deprivation, where they actually took some of these patients off of hormone therapy and allowed for testosterone recovery, that there was around two to three years freedom from androgen deprivation in those patients that uh, were treated with this aggressive strategy. These are not comparative studies, so it's hard to place too much stock in that. And so in summary of metastasis-directed therapy, ablative metastasis-directed therapies such as SBRT are associated with minimal toxicity risk, and they provide excellent local control. Uh, the current data are insufficient for determining the effect of such strategies on oncologic outcomes. And so uh, most of you, I think, got this right, where we just don't know how these interventions affect cancer outcomes yet, but they do appear to be safe. Um, uh, and they do appear to offer excellent local control. Um, this is a, a really sexy topic right now in terms of managing the prostate in, uh, in metastatic disease. There's a lot of work being done to facilitate prospective trials. Um, the rationale for treating the prostate uh, is improved pelvic disease control or prophylactic palliation. I think we've all seen patients who have uncontrolled pelvic disease and it's exquisitely morbid. So this is a methodology of getting in front of that. Um, uh, a very hot topic right now is how treating the primary tumor might augment host immunosuppression and potential anti-cancer immunomodulation, um, uh, this field of immunotherapy um, uh, is a very interesting space. And then of course what we're looking to do, similar to what we see when we do cytoductive nephrectomies and renal cell carcinoma, is by perhaps treating the mothership we may improve oncologic outcome. Um, there is no prospective studies on this topic. Uh, there is a, uh, a good amount of retrospective evidence. Uh, we undertook a project at University of Colorado uh, and incorporated a multi-institutional uh, group where we used the National Cancer Database uh, to conduct a query where we looked at men who were diagnosed with M1 prostate cancer, all of whom received upfront ADT. We excluded cryotherapy and brachytherapy as a local intervention, and we excluded patients who died within one month of diagnosis. 
and we use uh, standard statistical tools, uh, including propensity score matching and landmark analysis to determine what factors were associated with improved outcome. Here are the results of that uh, analysis. So we were able to identify um, uh, over 3,000 patients um, uh, through the database. Uh, there is good radiation detail through this database. That's one of the benefits of it. And you can see uh, in uh, figure A, there was an overall survival advantage attributable to radiation therapy uh, compared to hormone therapy alone that was fairly dramatic, reducing the risk by half. And when we did propensity score matching, that difference persisted and was approximately a third. This is the forest plot looking at uh, associations with um, uh, radiation versus hormone therapy alone. And you can see that um, regardless of subset, with the exception of patients who had a T4 lesion, again, the numbers were relatively small, um, uh, all these subsets seem to benefit from the local therapy. Uh, this is the landmark analysis uh, where we, uh, we tried to control for the fact of selection bias and perhaps the patients who were being selected for local therapy had better prognosis and longevity. And so what we found was that the benefit appeared to be similar for long-term survivors versus shorter-term survivors. Uh, we uh, used a prostatectomy group as well from this data set as a comparative. Um, this is a very, uh, fairly interesting result. So what we found um, is that in the prostatectomy and hormone therapy group, they had uh, comparable, uh, not significantly different survival outcomes compared to those who received high-dose radiation defined as above 65 gray, 65 gray or more, whereas if the patient received less than 65 gray, more consistent with a palliative dose of radiation, the outcomes for survival was similar to hormone therapy alone. So this suggests that ablative therapeutic uh, interventions to the prostate or the primary tumor are, are what really confers the potential advantage in this space. We're not the only uh, group to find this. There's actually a plethora of retrospective studies to show the same thing. Um, these are very large population data sets that looked at radical prostatectomy, brachytherapy, external radiation, IMRT, um, all of which uh, showed a similar result in terms of it, uh, better overall survival in the group that received therapy to the primary. In some of those studies, it attributed that improved overall survival to disease uh, or cause specific survival improvements. And there's two case control series that looked at radical prostatectomy and radiation respectively, also showing similar results. So in terms of prostate-directed therapy for M1 prostate cancer, radical treatments to the prostate have a well-defined safety profile and they likely reduce the risk of pelvic morbidity and need for subsequent palliative interventions. Primary debulking might augment the communicating ecosystem metastatic prostate cancer. Additional work needs to be done in this space. And there's several retrospective studies to support oncologic outcome improvement in men receiving radical therapy to the primary, but I'd like to emphasize that these results really need to be applied cautiously because of the retrospective design and the potential for selection bias and the likelihood that selection bias and other non-controlled factors influence the results. So I think the answer to this question currently, of our, of our, uh, our randomized answer, uh, is that we don't have prospective data on this space yet. We just have um, a fairly compelling body of retrospective evidence that I think supports having these conversations with patients. But we do need to do the randomized studies to demonstrate that this benefit truly exists. Thanks for your attention and, and uh, the people in the back for calling the audible.